All right, on to the next topic. At the beginning of this episode, I said that there is a particular old man who seems to keep pissing off a certain fan base. It keeps seems to uh, successfully piss off all of Twitter sometimes. It's really bizarre and also quite um, fascinating because, well, I don't think anybody has that power. But I'm talking, obviously, about Martin Scorsese. If you don't know who Martin Scorsese is... Well, I think you really should and just Google him and find all of his movies and give it all a watch because there is no other director like him right now and we don't have a lot of time left with him because he is uh, getting to a certain age. I don't think he'll be able to make a lot of movies after like a few years. So we should really cherish the time that we have with him. And anytime he says something... I feel like we are just looking at it from the wrong, in a wrong way. Not like we're, we're not, we're not assessing it correctly. We're not kind of, um, thinking about it in the right way or wrong way. That's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that we are looking at it from the wrong perspective. Anyways, going back to it, Martin Scorsese is a famous director and he's made fantastic movies. Goodfellas is probably my most favorite. I have yet to finish Irishman. I've finished half of it. The movie is very long, so it took me a bit of time to um, kind of continue on. So I'm thinking that by tonight or tomorrow, I'm going to finish the whole movie. But uh, I'm looking at my computer screen. He managed to piss off Twitter again recently. I would say February 17th was when Twitter kind of had Martin Scorsese trending on its search page. So I'm like, what happened? I'm like, whoops. Well, history repeats again. So uh, if you if you didn't know, Martin Scorsese said something about uh, Marvel movies being like equivalent to the equivalent to theme parks and how it's almost like a spectacle and people go there to enjoy the spectacle and like it's like a theme park but it's not exactly like cinema where you have to sit and you have to think about it and it's all that so people got heated about it as if you know people can't give their opinions about movies anymore it always has to be my way or the highway but whatever and then this time he talked about how most films are now like considered content he used the word he said that he has a problem with the word content i'm looking at the uh, an article from the rap the rap.com they said that the title of the article is Martin Scorsese is sick of calling movies content and film buffs are rooting him on. Well, film buffs are rooting him on, but Twitter was a completely different scenario (laughs) about like two days, about a day ago. Today's February 18th. So I just felt like I could maybe have some fun with it, maybe read the article with you guys and also give my own thoughts to it. Uh, I would say that I agree and disagree with some of the comments he made. I I do have some of my disagreements with some of the things he said. I'm not saying I completely am rooting him on and kind of agreeing with every word he's saying about content in general and saturation and all that. But before I get into it, I just want to get this very clear. Why is it? Why is it that every time this man opens his mouth... Like young Twitter, especially like Marvel fans, maybe some DC fans, but I don't know, Marvel fans just really get their heads in a knot, really get their panties in a twist. Why is it that every time this particular fan base gets pissed off, every time this man opens his mouth? What is it? It's just people can have opinions about movies. Now, I don't consider myself a Marvel fangirl simply because I've never read the comics, okay? But I love the movies. I really enjoy the movies. I won't say I'm particularly uh, equal about all the movies. I didn't enjoy Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I didn't enjoy Ant-Man and the Wasp. I was not particularly, you know, um, ecstatic about Captain Marvel. I'm not... I won't say I'm a complete fan through and through, and I haven't read the comics, so I can't consider myself a complete, like, Marvel, the, the Marvel comic book company or whatever universe (laughs) if it's a different faction from the movies the cinematic universe I, I haven't explored that region so I can't consider myself a complete fan but I am a fan of the movies but even then people are allowed their opinions people are allowed to have a difference of opinion about movies that's what critics are for and not only that this is what is really hilarious he's not 
calling these movies bad or awful or anything. He's saying that the the experience of the movies are different. So when before when he pissed off young Twitter, he pissed off Marvel fans when he said that uh, these movies are like theme parks. That was a moment when I actually kind of agreed because even though I don't say that they're not cinema, they are cinema. We're looking at, we're watching them at a cinema where we were, we are the theater when we watch them, but we're not having um, an experience like we would have with another movie like Hereditary or Parasite and something like that. That's a different kind of experience. When I go to a Marvel movie, I'm there for the spectacle. I'm there for the 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 explosions, the special effects, the VFX. Where I'm there for a ride. I'm there for a good time. I'm not there for like really difficult questions about life and existentialism and <laughs> depression and all that. I'm there for heroes fighting villains and uh, superheroes fighting monsters. It is what it is. You can't really deny that. And it has a kind of like that element to it. You know, it has a kind of like a very spectacly element to it where I'm looking at this like giant show in the octagon, except it's the whole city being destroyed by a monster versus one superhero with a hammer. <laughs> Where? <sighs> Anyways, but he is from a different era. So I'm like, okay, I, I understand where he's coming from. And I, I tend to agree. He's not saying Marvel movies are bad. He's saying it's a different feeling to watch a Marvel movie. He's not saying ban or boycott Marvel movies and watch my movies. That's not what he was saying. So I was, I was really kind of, uh, you know, it's just really bizarre to see that reaction. But this time, I have an agreement and somewhere I have my own thoughts. I won't call it exactly disagreement, but I'm, I would say I'm, I would say he's not looking at it from like the bigger picture. So I would say it's a, it's a somewhat disagreement with Martin Scorsese. So um, I'm going to start with, I'm looking at my points. So uh, I've just written a few I'm looking at the article. Let's just go with the article first. I'm just going to read the article a little bit. So it says that Martin Scorsese riled up a lot of Marvel fans with his comments that the MCU is not cinema, but the Oscar-winning filmmaker is now turning his ire to a much larger trend in Hollywood, the labeling of films as content. Like I said, he had a problem with the word. In a new essay for Harper's Magazine reflecting on the career of Federico Fellini, Scorsese lamented how the new era of streaming has made the dreaded C-word far too common in discussion of movies, particularly within the film industry. Yeah, I agree. People call movies, TV shows, YouTube videos, all of it content now. People just use the word content like it's like a f advertising or something. Uh, as recently as 15 years ago, the term content was heard only when people were discussing the cinema on a serious level, and it was contrasted with and measured against form, he wrote. Then gradually, it was used more and more by the people who took over media companies, most of whom knew nothing about the history of the art form or even cared enough to think that they should. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's, um, there are a lot of like, there's a lot of corporatism happening within movies nowadays, within the film, like the industry, the studios, and digital marketing companies, all of that. As someone who is looking at the art form as a biz, from a business perspective, is not going to understand the creative process that goes into movies. Movies mostly is about risk taking because you're putting, you're writing certain scenes, you're, you're kind of taking a chance with a certain story and elements and plot twists and sometimes killing off the main character and stuff because it's not, it's not Marvel. You know, in Marvel, you can't kill your hero unless you're about to end the franchise because, you know, you know that at the next movie, he's going going to be there you know iron man is going to be there unless there's there are no more iron man movies to milk so you can you yeah it, it cinema is very different they don't they don't care about the main character if the main character has to die to make an impact that's going to happen but that's not the most important thing uh the corporatism sometimes hampers uh the film the film experience the the the, the making experience of a film the directing ex aspect of a film but at the same time i would say yeah i agree like um companies and people with like corporate jargon people who think about things commercially all, most of the time even though they have good intentions they want everybody to make money from the movie they want the they want the producers and the executive producers everyone to make money and also be able to sell the movie yeah someone who looks at it from a commercial perspective or is only 
ex- experienced in the marketing area, like, you know, um, like a media company, you know, like an ad agency, they won't know what makes a good cinema unless they have actually studied the craft of film or are a fan of film, like Martin Scorsese is. I'm a fan of film, but even I would say it would take me a long time to really narrow down the 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 elements that makes a good film. I would say I have a particular idea about it, but I would I would definitely say it takes a long time to kind of accept that. And a media company... Uh, someone who has an MBA degree is not going to be able to uh, say that, particularly like what makes good film. Anyways, let's continue with the article. To him, the term content is now a business term for all moving images, whether it is The Irishman or any of the millions of TV shows, features, short films or documentaries that are listed alongside Scorsese's latest films on Netflix. In his words, content could refer to a David Lean movie, a cat video, a Super Bowl commercial, a superhero sequel, a series episode. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can see that. Many people say call everything content. It's like the Gary V lingo, right? Content, content, make content. Make, what, what is content? I feel like with the advent of uh, television moving on to the digital platforms and YouTube kind of taking center stage, I think there are going to be different words for it. Um, different categories of content, I get to say. They would say sub content. Like film would be film content and cat videos would be animal videos content or whatever, you know, home video content. People would have different words for it. But yeah, it's um, it's kind of a mixed bag. I do, you don't know what people are referring to when they say make some content. Like what what do you want me to do? Have a full production team or film my cat? What, what are you implying? So yeah, I can agree with that. While Scorsese acknowledges that the rise of streamers like Netflix and Apple TV Plus have allowed him and other filmmakers new opportunities to make movies, he is concerned that by piling millions of programs and films into a streaming service and then just relying on a computer algorithm to present a select amount of that content to a viewer, films from one of the greatest directors ever could easily get lost in the shuffle... Yeah, some of the greatest directors could ever could easily get lost in the show. Oh, sorry. Becoming devalued as a generation becomes less exposed to those classics because of the overwhelming selection on offer. A few exceptions he points to are curated streaming services like Mubi and Criterion Channel, as they present films to users on a hand-picked menu rather than having a computer to do the work. I guess that's the struggle for all of us. You know, for all of the YouTubers as well who are making good content, we're making like terrible content, we all get piled together and we have to compete with everyone. And um, if we are making content from a niche, like I, I'm making content from a movie niche, um, I'm going to have to compete with everybody that makes movie content, movie niche content or whatever. So yeah, it's, it is oversaturation and yeah, your the competition is very high, I would agree. So it's nothing different for films as well. We can depend on the movie business, such as it is, to take care of cinema. In the movie business, which is now the mass visual entertainment business, the emphasis is always on the word business, and value is always determined by the amount of money to be made from any given property, he warned. We touched upon that. In that sense, everything from Sunrise to La Strada to 2001 is now pretty much wrung dry and ready for the art film swim lane on a streaming platform. We have to make it crystal clear to the current legal owners of these films that they amount to much, much more than mere property to be exploited and then locked away. They are among the greatest treasures of our culture and they must be treated accordingly. I mean, I'm going to touch up on that, the whole thing. Yeah, everything... I would say, I would say quick aside. Yeah, I I agree with it. And um, uh, I'm just letting all the things that I agree with out of the way so I can tell you what I disagree with. But yeah, in this sense, you kind of feel it nowadays. You kind of feel this sense of like absence of greatness. And by that, I mean, when you think about movies like The Shining or 2001 or um, Citizen Kane or like uh, recently you would say Alien and stuff like that, 80s and 70s and 80s, those movies are kept in like a different kind of a place. But now um, if, if, if a great movie has come out, we don't exactly get to know it unless it's from word of mouth or like an award platform has given it some kind of a platform like Parasite God. Parasite, like famous movie critics on YouTube didn't review this film until it got the Oscar. So it's like Jeremy Johns didn't make a review about 
Parasite or Train to Busan and stuff like that until, you know, it became very, very popular through word of mouth or from the Oscars. So yeah, it, it does get devalued a little bit. It does get lost in the, the noise. So uh, the, the rest of the article talks about how like some people were defending him. Other people said that, you know, uh, this point was really great. Uh, that some argue that streaming has helped make the films of directors like Fellini and Kurosawa more accessible than they have ever been. This is very true. Y- you could get lost in the noise, you could, but the streaming platforms, all of these have kind of given most of the, these filmmakers kind of like the, the center stage sometimes, and most of the time it would have been hard to find their movies. It would have been Scorsese's movies or Tarantino's movies on the forefront, but now Federico Fellini and Kurosawa are also on the forefront because you can find them easily. You can easily access them. So in summary, I kind of agree that um, the yeah the, the the need for content and the need for like the algorithm to keep pushing content has driven like bad content forward sometimes. When it comes to like smaller content, when it comes to YouTube and stuff, yeah, you do see when you look at the trending page. Is it like, do you really want to watch anything that's on the trending page? Is it even appealing to you? It's mostly like, like bright thumbnails with like lots of weird things and like, and the title is like, you know, destructing some, destroying something or playing something or giving something away or some kind of like a family vlog and stuff like, I don't know what is on the trending page anymore. I don't even look at it, but that's kind of like what the algorithm is pushing on the trending page. So it's not even appealing to someone like me. And it kind of gives me the idea that it's more appealing to like a younger generation because someone young would get attracted to like a bright thumbnail with lots of colors and like a really kind of like a PG-13 kind of content. So you get the vibe there on YouTube. When it comes to movies and stuff too, yeah, but you have to, the algorithm does push a lot of crappy movies forward with like even with YouTube originals, even with Netflix, you do see that happening. I agree with that. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the good movies can get buried somewhere down the drain. Given that I agree with some of the points, here is where I disagree. Because of the content, the word, the new era of these media companies like Netflix and Mubi and Amazon Prime and YouTube originals in some cases, and even like a lot of other short film platforms, uh, YouTube being the biggest one, Vimeo also, and because of this push for content by these new algorithms, a lot of these filmmakers, a lot of these content creators wouldn't have had the chance to even put their foot in the door or even have a little bit of their time in the limelight. They would have had no way of making a film or getting their film funded or even showcasing their talent if it wasn't for new media. If it wasn't for these new forms of content, if it wasn't for this new age of cinema, of the digital platforms pushing forth this new kind of content, nobody would have been able to shine in this new era if it wasn't for these uh, platforms. So we do have to also see the benefit, which is a major, major benefit because If it wasn't for them, it would have just been people like Scorsese or Tarantino or Lynch or anybody else who has gone to Hollywood, been to Hollywood, talked, been in the office of like the, you know, this big, this big, (laughs) this big studios who would have been in those big studios talking to them about the movies, like the funding and stuff, and who would have been able to work with uh, the famous actors and stuff. They... It would have been just those people who would have excelled at this, who would have had the chance to make movies. Anybody who could not travel to Hollywood and talk to the people, talk to the right people, make the right connections, they would have never been able to pass their screenplay off or make their first movie or even get the short film. I'm not even going to jump to YouTube yet. I'm going to talk about the films. Like, you have great examples like David Sandberg. David Sandberg started making content on YouTube uh, with pushing his uh, short films like Lights Out and I can't remember all the other films he made. He made, uh, I have to look at his channel, but he made a, a, a buttload of uh, short films until James Wan saw one of his shorts and gave him a chance to work in Hollywood, made Lights Out as a full-length feature, and he went on to direct Shazam. 
you think someone from a different country would be able to go to Hollywood and work in a DC film? It, is that going to be possible for us, you and me, if we were from the 80s? I don't think so. I don't think if when Scorsese made Taxi Driver, people like you, people like me would have never dreamed of doing this. You know, like David Sandberg would not have had a chance in hell to make movies. And it's because of the algorithm pushing his movie, uh, his short film Lights Out, to all the people until it reached James Wan. Until it reached James Wan through his homepage or through word of mouth. That's how it happened. It's because of the power of the algorithm. So yes, there is going to be a lot of competition, but it's also going to be a way where like this, the, for, take this for example, this is a show that I've created on my own. I have no producer. There is no crew anywhere. This is just me talking to my little webcam. If I had this show on television, I would have gotten canceled within two episodes. I would have never gotten a chance to showcase what I have to say, to have a discussion, to build an audience, to have a community, to have just, just, just have some fun. I would have never had the chance if it were for, like if I had to go through the channels of radio or television or something, this would not have been possible. It would have been canceled a long time ago. So many content creators and so many YouTubers, so many uh, filmmakers have now gotten the chance to at least showcase their talent uh, within the sphere that, the downside, which Martin Scorsese talks about, the content, it's like, yeah, it, it gets buried. The, the content gets buried within, um, the, the, the whole, I would say, the, the, the pile, the, 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 the impossibly large pile of films and short films and videos that are being made on the internet digitally and on streaming platforms like the movie platforms. Of course, it's getting buried, but, this is also the, like, we also have to see that good movies, new movies, good television shows, good content creators, good YouTubers, good short filmmakers are also being highlighted. We do see them get viral views. We do see them have a million views hit their short film. We do see YouTubers with like 5 million subscribers in 11 months because they did something right. And you see that in their videos. They're not just making bad content, like bad let's plays with no one speaking and nothing happening and they're getting 5 million. That's not happening. You do see their content having high quality. It's one of the reasons why they keep getting, you know, subscriber after subscriber because every new person that comes and they're like, wow, you're making good content. Someone would be like, wow, you're making great short films. I want to subscribe to this. So you do see that happening, quality over quantity. So that kind of a push, you when, you, when I see something like that, when you see someone who has made it to the top, even within this impossibly large pile of content, it kind of gives filmmakers and content creators a push to do better, to beat the algorithm, to beat the algorithm in a way where you can rise above with good quality and consistency. It kind of gives people a sort of competitive push to do better. Whereas... In the old days, you could have just been been in the right place, met the right people, said the right things, and you could have had your movie made, you know, or just something like that. I don't know how it worked back in the day, but yeah, you could have, you would have had to be in, in Los Angeles to be in Hollywood or in India right now. I would have had to be in uh, Mumbai to work in Bollywood, something like that. So now I don't have to go to Bollywood to do it. I can just make an independent film wherever I am and I have a crew and I have a platform to showcase it. It's brilliant. So what I'm trying to say is that although I agree with Martin Scorsese, this new era, it's good and bad in, in that it's a double-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword because Many filmmakers, many um, many short filmmakers, many new people would have never had the chance to showcase their talent, to be talked talked about by like other filmmakers. They would have never had their names known if it weren't for the digital media. However, yes, it is a problem where um, something that's like a great film, like a brilliant film, if like it's this modern Citizen Kane could just be unknown, unseen, or even if it's seen, it's just, um, it's not seen 
for its greatness. People would not be able to recognize its greatness immediately until it's like taken some time to, through word of mouth. It be, it's become a cult hit or sometimes Oscars or like the BAFTAs give it the recognition it deserves and it goes, you know, it goes viral like Parasite did and everybody watched Parasite after that. That kind of happens. But it is it is a compromise now where competition is high and yes, the word content is used very loosely nowadays for everything. I do agree with it. But at the same time, it has given all of us an opportunity to shine. How bright is going to be up to the person? Because yes, there is going to be a, an algorithm that's deciding your fate. But you can really, instead of fighting the algorithm or complaining about the algorithm... You can give the algorithm a chance to help you. You can, if you can't beat them, join them. So you can give the algorithm a chance to help you by making the kind of content that's, that's, um, I'm using the word content. I'm sorry, Martin, but it is what it is. You can, let's say for content creators first and filmmakers second. For, for content creators, you can make the kind of content that is, that's watched by people, that's trending right now. That's like, you know, that's something that's just, that's just the, the the thing nowadays. Before it was pranks. Now it's like, you know, I don't know. Um, I would say helpful content, uh, talking head videos, commentary, whatever it is. Now that's trending. Uh, then maybe in the future, it's going to be something else. You never know. Uh, shorts are trending now because of TikTok. You do have YouTube shorts and everything like that. And then when it comes to filmmakers, uh, you have to look at what exactly do people want. Do people want short, short films or do people want long form content where you can make a longer uh, short film? It's not as long as feature, but it could be something smaller. What el What can you do and how can you increase your quality while at the same time not completely disappearing entirely? You know, you, you have to be consistent and, you know, work consistently to be better and to make more content and to, to, to kind of, put that out there uh, and how can you because at the end of the day connections and being at the right place at the right time meeting the right people that's always going to work but you're going to need money for that you're going to need scripts for that you're going to need uh, a plan for that what can you do to be there to go to Hollywood to do whatever you want what what are the steps you can take and the internet is the best place for that you can really start planning ahead and make more money and start doing commercial work whatever it is and um Nothing, none of this would have been possible for us if it wasn't for digital platforms and it, if it wasn't for the algorithms. So I do agree with uh, Martin Scorsese on some of the things, but what I'm trying to say at the end of the day, he is, he is from a different place and time now. So he's not looking at the bigger picture of what's benefiting us and what's kind of, to him, what looks like the devaluation of cinema. Although it may seem like it, it is what it is. I agree. But at the same time, it kind of gives people the push to do better and be better. And also it's kind of giving all of us a chance to have our own TV series and make sure, because the end of the day, the only people that rise are the people that make consistently good quality content so that those are the people that rise it's the same with filmmakers so it kind of gives everybody a uh, 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 an oversaturated market that kind of looks overwhelming so it kind of is easy to give up on but at the same time people who are competitive people who are like you know crazy uh would it, it would give them this push it would give them a competitive motivation to do better because they will see examples of people rising above and succeeding in today's world, you see movies like Hereditary or The Lighthouse and stuff like that. Um, while at the same time, I do kind of agree that, you know, Marvel and everything is taken over, especially as an Indian, because I don't know about like Hollywood. Uh, I, I don't know about American movie theaters and stuff. But in India, uh, Hollywood movies are competing with Bollywood movies. So when it comes to like something that's independent, our house, a movie, it's going to compete with not only with like the upcoming Marvel movie or the DC movie, but also with a very popular, much awaited for Bollywood movie. So because of that, 
on one screen, you have a commercial Bollywood movie. And on the other side, you have a high budget Avengers movie. The art house movie, like Hereditary, doesn't get a chance to play in a theater. So people like me from like a small town in India, we're, we don't get the chance to really experience cinema in the big theater most of the time. Most of the time, those movies get booted off. Maybe they'll be there for like three days and then, you know, get replaced by the newest Bollywood spicy flick. So I do I do agree that, yeah, it is... Um, those movies don't get the chance anymore. I didn't get to experience Hereditary. Can you imagine experiencing Hereditary on screen, on like the big screen? I would have sh myself. I have no doubt I would have sh myself. I would have really liked to watch that movie on the big screen, especially like Lighthouse and stuff like that. Those movies, they do get a chance, but it's like you don't even know when it came in the theater. But it's really hard. It's really hard for them to exist in like our theaters if there's like the next Bollywood movie coming up and the next Marvel movie coming up so yeah it is uh it is a double-edged sword and the competition is high but um I like to look at things uh I like to look at the positive in things and the positive in me uh, the positive in me is saying that I wouldn't have been able to talk to you right now if it wasn't for the algorithm and if it wasn't for content and the media companies so I do like it but there is no way that I'm going to say that Martin Scorsese is wrong because, well, there's a lot to learn from the man and we should cherish him for however long he is with us and however long he is with cinema because, well, his movies are exceptionally badass. I'm going to end this episode today. At this point, I said that I was going to uh, talk about the third thing, about something that I kept as a surprise, but I'm kind of tired a little bit. I think it's... Uh, it's almost midnight now and uh man i'm just <laughs> i'm i'm pooped so i'm going to go and wrap this up and i'm going to i'm going to be here next week again and then i'm going to talk about that thing so i'm really glad that you were here and give thank you for giving me a chance and being till the end of the episode uh this will be uploaded as an excerpt on my shree nation channel but if you want to watch the full episode of this you can listen to it on shree talks a lot on my channel, on my YouTube channel, Shri Talks A Lot, and on any other podcast platform like Spotify, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, except for Apple, I think. <laughs> but you can listen to it on Spotify or watch it on my other YouTube channel, Shri Talks A Lot. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope I didn't waste your time. Don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to give it a like, and share, and let me know if you need, if you want me to talk about any other topic, leave it in the comments. Well, See you next week.